Hello everyone and welcome to Tuesday Open News. I have to say I can't get over the amount of news um, and I used to have this theory that there was only 100 days of news for every 365 days of the year. Now I think that we're um, overdoing it on the news, 500 plus days of news for every day of the year. We're going to focus mostly today on vaccines, deployment, who gets it, how the, uh, the government uh, operates on it. But you know the nature of open news is we're in the market for stories and story ideas. Please, everyone, weigh in. Um, my colleague, uh, Liz Mosley, is uh, curating. I'm not sure that's the word, is it, Liz? Is just tickling up the chat from uh, everyone, uh, colleagues in the Tortoise Newsroom, members of the Tortoise Newsroom. It's great to see you all. Um, please do weigh in. Oh, now it's gone all dark on my screen. I don't understand how this works. I've got this weird camera. That I don't know, that Phoebe's having the giggle. So Phoebe is one of our new colleagues who's helping to operate this. I don't know whether, Phoebe, you've kind of quietly darkened me, but that's what's going on here. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to definitely talk about vaccines. I do want to talk about the economy. I've got to be in my bonnet, as you know, about Rishi Sunak. I think if there's anyone who's got sort of more than just um, feelings about what's happening in the US, that would be interesting uh, uh, to hear that, so where, so how that works would be really helpful, um, and where we should take that story-wise. Just to give you a sense of what we're working on, as you've seen this week, we've really focused on that Jack Ma story. Um, uh, actually, it's been one of those stories that feels like it's an amazing way to get at the nature of modern China. We had a thinking on it this morning, but please do take a look at it. It's a really good way uh, of uh, of kind of getting into the the, the nature of modern Chinese capitalism and you'll see Liz just dropped in the uh, the news list and and likewise that gets us into uh, qu uh, quite a good uh, set of conversations chiefly around as I said uh, vaccines but it gets us into uh, uh, coal and Peabody it gets us into one of these big questions that you've seen in this NYPD uh, story and it gets into the big uh, US China uh, relationship so we've got room for all of that I'm particularly keen today, if we can, to hear from some of the people who've joined Tortoise in the last few weeks. Uh, we've got some new colleagues and we'd love to hear from them. Um, but if I might, I'm going to go to uh, Kerry Thomas just to get us started. Because Kerry, we've had, a, we've had a conversation, assuming Kerry's there, we've had a conversation about vaccines for a while. Um, what, what do you make of the Pfizer announcement and what should we? be thinking about next? I well, was sitting here thinking about lunch, I'm afraid. So um, I, um, quite slightly, I think, so I, I, um, I think it's, it's interesting what a character John Bell, Sir John Bell, Bell the Regis Professor of Medicine has become <clears throat> through this, through this pandemic. So when I heard him on the radio yesterday saying, this is exciting and we get our lives back by spring next year then then my ears really start to to prick up um so i think we had a conversation i think the question of who gets it is really interesting you know there's a lot of focus initially on on the logistical questions the, the fact that it has to be kept very cold this particular vaccine that won't be quite as true of the oxford astrazeneca one assuming that comes along but I think the logistical things are stuff that we know how to, in the end, in, in this country and in Western countries, we will be able to deal with. There are separate, separate questions in, you know, Africa, South America, wherever, but, um, but not so big here. The, we had a question in the newsroom a few weeks ago about who gets it. Um, so, and the, the bit I really felt then that I hadn't thought about enough was if we start, if we are led by, mm -hmm. The groups at risk, then that does take you in some really fascinating areas. Um, old people, I think, will be relatively uncontroversial. So, uh, you know, you'd expect this to go to people over 50 or over 60, whatever the cutoff is. But if you start, if, if the decision is, as it would be on the evidence, that you give this to certain black and minority ethnic groups of people um, in advance of giving it to other groups, then at that point, I think um, the whole thing gets a lot more interesting and a lot more dangerous for policymakers. 
so I so I do find that that like a really fascinating uh, set of problems that the government's going to have to wrestle with. Mm. Chris, do you want to? I mean, uh, I'm going to come to Chris and Giles if I might on this too. But uh, Chris Cook, you wrote. I mean, I was really actually it was one of those rare days where you can read the Sense Maker uh, mid morning and think, God, actually there is quite a lot of good news to digest here. Chris, you you, you seem. Would you want to just talk through what you think of it, partly on its effectiveness, but partly on, on the extent to which we, quote unquote, go back to normal? So I think the, um, the thing that's really surprising, the, sort of the reason why everyone is so relieved, is the importance of it being a 90% effective vaccine. So if you have a, if, remember that they, this whole thing would get licensed at 50%, so it only needs to have like an even chance of, of helping you out. And the maths of a disease that sort of standing position in normal society has a reproduction rate of three-ish is that you need to have 60-70% of the population uh, immune. And obviously if you have a vaccine that's only 50% effective, then you can't get through the vaccine to 60-70% immune, right? You, there's a, you have a, sort of pro, a, a simple arithmetic constraint there. Um, the fact that it's 90% effective means that you can target people. So you can say in the first wave, we think the following kinds of people are spreading it and you can sort of pick off strategies to, to hit them and to, you know, put them to one side. And it also means that by the time you've rolled the thing out, you can be really sure we've carpeted the relevant bits of the population mm -hmm. and that they're not going to be able to spread it and catch it. So the, the gap between 50 and 90% is, is the reason why there's such jubilation. Like it's a thing that's, that bit of arithmetic is really, really important. And it does offer the prospect that we can be pretty close to normal if we can, if this thing gets approved and it's at the sort of levels of effectiveness. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's it's why the airlines are coming back, right? The ultimate uh, and the cinemas, like it, it is, it's a real sign. It's a really big thing that that differential. The other thing about it is that it's it's the same. They're targeting the same uh, feature of the virus, if you like, um, to trigger the immune response as other as other vaccine program mm -hmm. and that, that that bit of the 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 virus is enough to trigger a good immune response is really good sign that there'll probably be other options too so there will be a, a hopefully be a range of vaccines available through the next year and what about and the one question i had uh, chris about the spring was when i looked at the numbers the 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 point about production and refrigerated distribution makes me think really are they going to be able to get enough en masse out to people by the spring so I mean, maybe not by the spring impossible. so maybe not by the spring but remember right it's pfizer right it's not three guys in the garage like yeah. uh, we'll keep forgetting it's not they're not a group of scientists it's pfizer and yes. the they do every year they rush to produce enough flu vaccine for you know a huge swathe of the population like the, the en masse high speed vaccine rollout is a thing we do we did for Ebola, Ebola is one of these, uh, the Ebola vaccine was one of these ones that had to be delivered at minus 80 degrees, like this one. Right. Um, and that is a constraint, but it's Pfizer, right? Like it's, you know, they know what they're doing. They're, you know, it's a big logistics company ultimately. Yeah. Um, and I think- And, 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 and Chris, can, you, can I ask you, because Zav's asked a question in the chat, which is when you say back to normal, do you mean like no masks, no social distancing? Well, is, think, that, is that what you think we're going towards? We're probably going to end up in a situation where um, there'll be there'll be more left to your own discretion on risk. So so probably masks will stay normal a normal constraint into you know well into next year. Bit of caution on social distancing. We'll start letting people. We'll start saying to people um, if you've been vaccinated, you can. We won't probably won't enforce it, but if you've been vaccinated, you're probably safe to go to a cinema now. Um, if you haven't been vaccinated, you shouldn't because you don't know the other people. Um, you know, um, you won't, you know, you won't catch it, but um, the, you know, you can start opening up things and start allowing things to start becoming more discretionary on your own. Fundamentally, the, the thing about the vaccine is at this level of effectiveness is it reduces the externalities connected with the pandemic. So your own ability to cause havoc for other people will suddenly start falling away. If, if other people are much more likely to not be susceptible and you can be confident yourself, you're not susceptible. And basically, the, I think the big, we talk about pubs and cinemas. The big question wants to be was can grandparents hug grandchildren? And Eventually. at a 90% effectiveness, they can. Grandparents, are, yeah, exactly. And then grandparents, well, we, 
one of the things we don't know is whether it's um, whether it's evenly well because we don't have enough data yet. We don't know if it, there are there are subgroups who are who are more likely to do better from this than others. So it yeah. might turn out actually that um, so one they they recently added people with Down syndrome to the list of highly susceptible people. So they've mm. gone into the sort of what used to be the top shielding category. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're still learning about this disease and we may learn new things about this disease that mean yeah. that actually there are people, we might find out that if you're over 80, actually yeah. you'll find it very hard to mount an immune response because of the, something about this virus. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, so I think, I, 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 it's really, I'm going to come, by the way, I see that Richard Caldwell makes the point that not being susceptible is different from not transmitting. Actually, we had a conversation a few weeks back with Sir John Bell, who, as Kerry rightly points out, is saying it's going to be things are going to be good by spring, early summer. In fact, he told us that he was going to book his holidays uh, back in Canada. In fact, he booked his flights, he said, back in Canada for the summer of next year. But he did also say that the vaccines might mean you're not susceptible to the virus, but you could still carry it up in your nose and your mouth and your upper airwaves. So you still could could transmit it. So, so Richard Caldwell's point is right. Mm -hmm. um, but but Lu can I, Lucy Hoogman, can I just pick up? I, I suppose that we're talking about two things, aren't we? Who's vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And then and then the distribution of the vaccine amongst those different vulnerable groups, because there's there's a hierarchy, isn't there, of that vulnerability? I don't know. I've got a new letter saying I'm clinically critically vulnerable, which is scary. Um, mm. Before, all of us in our family were shielding, but now it's only me for some reason. So it's all a bit mysterious. I'm not sure it's been very widely discussed how that how that's being drawn up. I've written to our GP to find out. Who, if what, they why? Know. Why they've ident why they've sent you? Why well, just well, there were three now. There's one. So obviously somebody is informing the department that's sending out the letters. Is it the GPs? I don't know. I don't mind. I don't really mind. I just it, yeah, it's quite new nice new information. Yeah. Um, mm. And also, if you have immune system problems, um, there are only certain vaccines you can take. So you can't take live vaccines. So the the different vaccine technologies. I haven't looked to see which one this particular yeah. one is, but there are yeah. about six different vaccine platforms. And mm. I'm sure uh, Chris probably knows all about that. Um, and they all do, you know, they all work in different ways and some seem live, some are dead, some are, are DNA, they replace a bit of your DNA, which sounds really scary, but maybe fine. So there's lots of stuff we don't know. As the public, I mean, we, the public, I, I, um, and then the trials, again, the trials are all different. So yes, the John Bell, obviously, totally fascinating. But they did something very strange in Oxford. They said at the beginning they were going to test against the saline placebo, which is the gold standard type of trial. Mm -hmm. Then they changed their minds and tested against the meningitis vaccine. Question, nice. why? Uh, I know some answers, but I don't want to sound like an anti-vaxxer, so I'm not going <laughs> to talk about them. Um, I mean, I can talk about them. Well, you, so, uh, either way, say, say, say what you think, Lucy. Well, I, I think it's, well, I don't know, actually, but I think most vaccines cause some kind of local reaction, like a swelling or a lump, or you may get some symptoms. So if you've got uh, groups of trialists and one group has saline and they don't get the lump and they don't get the swelling and they don't get the symptoms and the other people do uh, what they've said is that that will distort the test findings because psychologically they might know they might know if they haven't had the proper vaccine because they haven't had any of the usual types of things that go with vaccines and that might skew the reporting now that's the argument in favour of not having saline. Mm -hmm. um, certain people in America, I'm not going to mention because I don't want to cause controversy, you know what I'm talking about, uh, and who write about vaccination say that it, it is fairly standard practice in maybe American pharmaceutical companies to test against something that isn't a saline solution so that people don't complain about getting hurt because mm. everybody then gets something with their vaccination. 
some so, reaction. I have no idea, but I don't know why Oxford changed their mind. Yeah. And I, 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 I would like to know. I don't really need to know as long as it's safe in the end, but it, it made me curious. Do, 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 know, anything about vaccine distribution, it's really not my... I have no, absolutely no idea how you do that. Lucy, thanks for that, because I think I, I suppose we were actually just tiptoeing to, towards what we understand about the trial process and what we understand about the, um, the, the quote unquote risks of taking the vaccine. I, I just had to go to Giles. We'll tell Giles, are you there? Yep. So Giles, what's your read on this? And I'm sorry I keep on fading darker and lighter. I'm not quite sure my camera's in, in a mood of its own today. Um, Giles, what do you, what, what's your read on what's happened? And also I suppose to Lucy's point, some of the questions that are now going to come to the fore about question marks over vaccines, the anti-vax campaign, mm. government's capacity to kind of roll the pitch on this. The only concrete thing I can add, and, and Bash is uh, uh, talking about it in the chat as well, is and uh, fortuitously we put it in the news list today. There is a report out from the British Academy and the Royal Society today reported by Reuters uh, on precisely this subject. Um, I think the coincidence uh, with the vaccine news is coincidental, saying that um, for any decent vaccine uh, need, needs 80% uh, uptake to uh, deliver herd immunity, and that in the UK at any rate, about 36% of the people who would need to be vaccinated would be hesitant uh, for some reason or other. Doesn't mean that they're sort of hardline anti-vaxxers, but would be hesitant. And a professor mm, at Oxford, whose name I put in the news list, uh, interestingly for me, um, suggests that there should be a new approach to dealing with this which I, could, I would paraphrase as non-didactic, not hectoring, not badgering, but dialogue. Um, uh, I, I, I could make a confession, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, I, but I think, I think that must be a good well, strategy. A nobody was, nobody teased... likes to be told they're wrong. What? Told us what tells the confession? Do you remember... Uh, oh, God, I'm going to make such an ass of myself. Really? Okay. Yeah. No, I'd do anything for a byline in the, in the old days. Uh, on the Times, at the time of the MMR scandal, uh, but before the Daily Mail's approach to the story was, was properly, totally debunked, right? And, mm. and, and, and it was just about uh, reasonable to, to, to worry a little bit. I had small children, uh, the then features editor, and, and what you could not get in the UK was separate measles, mumps and rubella vaccines. You could only get uh, the full thing. And so at the Times' expense, I took the Eurostar and my whole family to Paris to get separate measles shots in order to write a piece about how, um, about how that was the only way to get them if you wanted to, and how indignant I was that I was being told by doctors and government uh, that I was stupid to consider uh, uh, want the, the option of separate shots instead of the MMR vaccine, which everybody told us was safe and of course is safe. So, Sorry, so that's I, my confession. No, it's, 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 it's not scandalous, Charles. I think it's, I think it's not scandalous, but, I, but, it's, but, it's, but, but really interesting. I, I'm gonna, I want, Nimo, can I go to you? Because I, I see that you said that everyone's got a you first approach to the vaccine. Uh, and I'm sure lots, and I saw that Liz is saying, yeah, me too. Nimo, are you, are you there? Yeah. Okay, so could, because we talked about this the other week and you were saying that your mother is very, anti not anti-vax, but suspicious of the vaccine. And I think you said your sister too. Yeah. And I, yeah, I kind of thought that everyone was on my page for some reason where I was just like, I'll take the vaccine. Like I don't, like, even if I don't know very much about it, I'll just take it. And I realized that I was very much alone on this because like all of my friends, like everyone that I've talked to has basically like said, actually like, I'll wait, like I'd rather just like continue doing what we're doing now, like social distancing, kind of not living life in a normal way and wait as long as I need to, to find out if, if this is to, to, to watch like the you first mentality, like you go first, I'll see what happens to you. And then I'll consider taking it like, 
you know, in a year's time or something. And even though that's not like anti-vax by any stretch of the imagination, like it's definitely like people don't trust it at all. The inclination, the immediate reaction is I don't trust it. And it's not just like my mum and my family, but it's like people that I went to uni with. It's like people that I went to school with. It's it's the majority of people in my, like from what I've is, is there any, I see Tess is saying, saying is, there any, is there any information you're getting about the vaccine other than just, you know, breaking news headlines? Is there anything that is that is coming through that's giving you any sense of how the vaccine's created, what safety levels are? Do, do you see anything on the information front other than if you like the noise? Um, well, personally, I, I mean, maybe I'm not just not looking for it like hard enough, but yeah, I've kind of only seen the big like headlines that, and I've only read the big stories that have come out um, about it. I'm sure that the information is out there, like if I really wanted to find it and like know about it. But like mm. if I have and I, like I think it's my inclination is I'm ready to go, like I'll take it. But most people, they look at these headlines and they like kind of switch off and they don't want to look any further. And they're what well, again, most people being very anecdotal on my end, but it's yeah. just yeah, it is just like from what I see, like, even if it is 90% effective or whatever, like, I don't understand how we're going to break the barrier of like getting when it's not mandatory getting people to actually take it. Okay, I'm, I'm just Kerry, I'm just gonna go back to you. I'm sure you're probably hoping you can have lunch. But I just want to go back. Do you know where, where things have got to with Kate Bingham? Well, I don't know whether or not actually even if Matt Dancone is here, Matt might know that because we talked a little bit about this. With Kate Bingham, do you say, James? Yeah. Only what's in the press today. So uh, she's leaving around Christmas time from that job. Um, there's a very lively debate happening, isn't there, about whether without her um, we would have been as well equipped with the um, with the vaccine as um, with this Pfizer vaccine as we as we will be. And I remember Matt. If Matt is not on the line, and I don't think he is, is he? Um, I remember Matt. When he sort of reported back to a conversation we had internally about vaccines a couple of weeks ago saying that whatever she is she's not she's that people she's not seen as another dido harding that actually that what, what he was hearing was that she was seen as, as actually pretty effective so um i'm afraid that's the sum total of my um my i think what interests me about this discussion because we again we talked about this internally is, is how you know when we talk about when giles talks about other vaccines as comparators, then we're talking about, let's take measles as an example. You're talking about something, a disease that, that has um, a similar effect across the, the target group for its, for its vaccinations. So measles is, is, is a dangerous disease for all children. I think the, the, the tricky thing to get our heads around when it comes to COVID is that its effect on different age groups is so radically different that, you know, whether in the end, we will want to vaccinate under 40s. I appreciate that long COVID is the kind of wild card in all this. We need to understand long COVID better to, to, to properly under, to make that sort of risk calculation. But actually, if, if we're not going to clog up the NHS with patients, if we vaccinate the vulnerable groups, if we if we limit the number of deaths by vaccinating those, those, those groups, then, then how great a demand will there be for universal vaccination in this country? Mm. Are we going to treat this as more similar to a winter flu and just vaccinate the vulnerable and let the rest of, the rest of us carry on? Mm. Or actually, is it more like a measles? It's such an interesting thing how quickly, I mean, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago and how quickly this has gone from being uh, research and development to communications and distribution and it's so very fast out of the hands of the scientists and into the hands of the politicians I'm, I'm struck I'd like to I'd love to hear from Susie Kershaw because um, I'm about to say I'm the son of a doctor who's always then ve they're very wary about taking medicine uh, and why not wonders about what that does when that gets into your system there's a bit of what Susie Kershaw was saying in her comment which is about you're avoiding those things. Susie, are you there? Are you yeah. To, yeah, yeah. I've just finished lunch, so that's all right. <clears throat> Lucky you. Um, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you well. Yeah. Um, I, I, in recent years, and I, I don't want to start getting into the woo-woo or the standard things, but from complementary health point of view, I've been very interested in different ways in which energy uh, is a medicinal 
um, uh, how shall I say, you can use energy to counteract your the destabilization that illness or disease is supposedly about. Mm. And um, in a contact with people who are in the world of dowsing, uh, people are able to identify why uh, there is illness or disease going on in a body. And one of the things was a guy called Jack Temple, who did a lot of work on this um, years ago. Uh, but it struck me that what he had identified was people who came to him had absolutely unidentified causes for illnesses that nobody could help them recover from. Mm. And one in various areas, he identified that it was the, what I would call carrier of a vaccination that had been given to that person years ago, which had become a negative uh, um, harmful thing in this person's body. It was difficult to identify. It wasn't necessarily uh, part of the long list of what is wrong with vaccinations, but it was present. And I thought very interesting because I just think that um, <clears throat> I've looked after my health as hard as I can all my life. And I believe that I'm trying to keep my own anti-immune system as robust as possible. Mm. So if I'm going to be asked to take a vaccination up to now, I mean, I am well into an age group where I should have been taking things, right? And mm -hmm. accepting a vaccination every winter, et cetera. And I have never done that. Not as a sort of major, I'm not gonna stand up in the streets and shout about it, but it's just, I found now it's my choice. So if I'm being offered a vaccination for this, and it raises for me the question, exactly what you were saying earlier about, um, am I going out into a public where I believe I've taken care of, I am looking after my own robustness, but where do I stand on the, am I going to infect somebody else if I don't have a, an effective vaccine, a vaccination? Or am I going out there saying, this is a model that I believe we should all be emulating, which is we must take care of our own robustness and mm. therefore we can be part of a mixed herd. Yeah, so, so you know what, I, I would, um, I'd love to come if I can, Susie would say on an extension of that to Louise Jarvis, because she's raised the vitamin D question. And, and when I was talking, a couple of weeks ago, we did one of our behind the news podcasts. I was talking to David Davis. It was actually, um, it was actually about government contracting. And, and yeah. at the end of it, he said, oh, you know, by the way, I've written to Hancock about vitamin D. There's clearly an issue around vitamin D, which is something entirely different from a vaccine. I see Louise Jarvis has raised it. I know my um, colleague and co-founder, Katie Bannock-Smith, also is a vitamin D fan. Louise, are you there? Yes, hello. Hello there. So, so Hi. are you are you sort of a, saying what's going on with vitamin D or are you a buyer of the idea that actually some encouragement of great use of vitamin D would be really helpful on this front? I, I think so. I mean, I sort of like I'm been, always been a big advocate of vitamin D anyway. Um, and um, so like uh, I, I worked with a charity we worked with on a couple of signing seekers coming over. So many of those from Africa and whatever. And we when they first arrive, we kind of pump them with, with vitamin D because we find it's just the, the both the physical and the mental health benefits of it. But also myself, I'm one who takes it every winter and I know others who take it all the way through. Um, but also I've, I've heard snippets through the conversations on COVID about the benefits of uh, it's so like people with high vitamin D seem to have greater resistance to it. I don't know how true that is. I, I sort of like haven't read a great deal of it, but I just think, you know, why, if that is the case, you know, why is that not being promoted massively? It's not a vaccine. It's not a, an answer to everything, but actually I think within this country with sort of like with the weather, particularly going into winter that we have and stuff, there is a math de deficiency in the population of vitamin D mm. and it, it could be a, uh, inverted commas quick win and a real benefit uh, you know and uh, just on the side is, is that part of the reason why covid it, uh, apparently isn't so prevalent in some of the um, african countries is it because the high vitamin because people are out in the sun and they're getting the natural vitamin d that way which we miss out on here mm -hmm. it's just I, I was just asking the question because i heard a bit about it but then it all seems to have gone quiet or it could have been just me that not it's, hearing yeah. about it um, well they're different Sort of, I saw Louise Simpson is saying 
that there are those people who said actually its its benefits are overstated. Right. I, I, I'd heard I'd heard also a number of these reviews, although on small sample size, is saying it was it was very it was very valuable. I'm going to come to the conversations going on between Phoebe Davis and Nikki Gorb about the way in which people will take vaccines if they're required for travel and they are mandatory going into certain countries. So I'm going to come to that in a second. Before I do though, I just wanted to go to my colleague Tess Murray. Tess, I'm I'm really I was really struck by your sort of rat-a-tat-tat message there that says, okay, this is the way we need to deal with this. It was uh, licenses oh, yeah. in country oh, generic drug production, community-led comms, peer-to-peer -peer communications. I this is how you would begin to roll it out. Do, do you want to yeah. just talk talk about that? And particularly on the comms side, I'm really interested in the peer-to-peer -peer comms, yeah. how you, how you run that. I, I, I'm slightly piggybacking off of what someone else mentioned earlier about the kind of the didactic versus dialogue communications processes. If you go back to, you know, when we were young, James, I was young. Still, we yeah. are, yes. Like yeah, um, but we grew up in the shadow of AIDS. You know, we were all told to be absolutely petrified about ever having sex, like yes. anyone wanted to sleep with us anyway. But anyway, in theory, we were told to be really scared about having sex. And, um, and you know, floating icebergs and it's gonna kill you. Um, if you hold hands with someone. So I was actually teaching in Africa in 1990. And that sort of heavy handed top down uh, public health campaign landed really badly. I mean, this was really early in AIDS as well. This is 1990. And I, I still remember my kids telling me a uh, AIDS just stands for American Ideas for Discouraging Sex. It was a complete sort of we don't trust it, we don't believe it, some Western world is coming to tell us how to behave and you can get stuff. And what I think you've seen over the course of 30 years in, <clears throat> in the sort of international development world and world of public health, global health, is what works is when you, well, first of all, I still find it amazing how long it took to, to issue licenses for, gen for generic drug production in Africa for, for antiretrovirals. So we know we can't wait 20 odd years for that to happen. We need to do that fast. We need to do, that's got to be, you know, distribu production distribution has got to be in country. We know that, you know, Western ways of working can't be imposed on countries and can't be imposed on our own population. You know, we, 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 you know, the respect for institutions is long gone. You can't tell us what to do. You've got to help us understand. And, and so what has worked most effectively if you, if you lift and learn from, HIV AIDS is community based, you know, mm -hmm. create leaders within your own communities, peer to peer. So I've worked particularly with teenagers and young people who are incredibly effective peer to peer communicators, if they're empowered and given the right information. So I'm just thinking there's an awful lot we can learn from the fight with HIV AIDS, um, that we don't have to wait 30 years to learn for this yeah. fight. There's something, really interesting, there's something fun enough, really interesting. I, I suppose you know, if, if Matt were here, Matt and Dan Cohen, that is, we would talk about the extent to which, and have talked endlessly about the extent to which this government is a government of campaigners, not administrators. I, they, they're always in campaign mode. They're always telling things in three word slogans, etc. There is something interesting though on, on what you say, which is if you harnessed some of the approach to elections and election comms, i.e. Could you get peer-to-peer -peer recommendations? Could you start using uh, people in your own community to, to, to talk to you? Might actually have a much, much better chance of actually being effective. I mean, interesting whether you could fire up that old machine. Yeah, but I, uh, there are two things that worry me about that, James. One is that we're going into to the biggest public health campaign of our lives yes. with a government with the worst trust levels that we've ever seen. Yeah. So, you know, to apply a political campaigning approach to it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure there are elements that can, that can read across. And also what worries me is, you know, the government utterly failed to involve uh, regional leadership at the beginning of COVID. Yes. What are they going to do about this? And they're going to have to here, and they're going to have to get really, uh, sorry, business speak, they're going to have to get really granular into yeah. communities. And they've just not shown themselves to understand that at yeah. the outset of this. So they're going to have to learn bloody fast yeah. and, re and relinquish control, but let people who know how to deliver public health campaigns on the ground in communities know, really, get involved. Is a really, that's a really good point. Um, 
Kerry, can I do one thing before I go to Phoebe and Nikki on this travel question, which is just to test his point about development of generic um, licensing of generic production. Right? What happens in a world if um, AstraZeneca and Oxford come through in the next three weeks? So you have a an Oxford um, Astra vaccine and a Pfizer um, vaccine. Who decides which ones you get? How does the NHS decide? How do you as a citizen know what you get? How do you measure the relevant side effects? Who, 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 who plays God in that department? Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> I mean, there's one interesting thing, which is, uh, which is a positive. If, if you do get the Astra Oxford one as well as the Pfizer one, they're different types of vaccine. Yeah. So that means that you don't have a clash on the supply chain, which you could have if the Imperial vaccine came through, which is the, which would be reliant on the same the same component chemicals as the as the Pfizer one. You could have a scrap in the supply chain as well as in the delivery chain. <clears throat> so, so it would get you around that. <coughs> I think the question would be: Are they as effective? Um, and again, I think people are reading from the Pfizer result that probably the Oxford Astra vaccine will also be pretty effective. But if you've got one vaccine that is 70% effective, another one that's 90, then, then you've got a problem. And, I, and, and I, I have no idea who plays God in that, whether you would simply give the most effective vaccine to the most vulnerable people. Um, the, the, um, Charles, can you, can you just talk through the, 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 price, the price question? I forget the actual um, differential, but at the time when Gates um, sent us the, his op-ed about the COVAX scheme, mm. uh, by which he plans to harness the energies of most of the uh, big pharma players, uh, it was clear that uh, the Pfizer vaccine was by an order of magnitude going to be more expensive than any other. As I recall, um, AstraZeneca and others are going to offer it at cost, at least initially, and, and for the COVAX scheme, whose, whose aim <laughs> is to get it distributed globally, according to need, not means, um, that um, it, was, it was two or five dollars a dose, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I mean, if, yeah. if, if you're sitting uh, in Matt Hancock's shoes, uh, wondering how to use it, NHS funds. I, I I assume it is a factor if efficacy is comparable. Yeah, but it has to be really, really narrowly comparable. I would have thought really narrowly comparable. Can I just can I just go? I want to. I said I said I want to go to Phoebe and Nikki, but I want to go to Chris Cregan too because Chris has got a follow up comment on on, on Tess's uh, point about you know comms at, in the age of AIDS and what we learn. Um, are you, Chris, are you there? Because I'm really interested uh, in what you have to say about the sort of the failure of that uh, communicators approach to AIDS. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, I've, I've got, uh, I've got, uh, I remember it exactly as you do, which is there were these really terrifying ads on TV, but, but they weren't going to change really change what you thought or how you how you felt or much how you behaved and I wonder whether or not you you think that there are read across there are lessons that you know uh, in in this in, in the in this vaccine um well I, I, mean, I guess the vaccines are, you know the massive game changer isn't it because 40 years after the arrival of HIV um we don't have a vaccine you know it took 16 years to get to combination therapy and 36, 37 years to get to PrEP. Um, and so the parallels, and I've written about this quite a bit, um, the parallels, the lexicon of all of this, um, ha, you know, have been absolutely relentless. Um, and I lost my partner to, to AIDS in the, in the 90s, just before the arrival of, of, uh, of, 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 of combination therapy. Um, but, you know, back then, um, when I met him um, in 1985, um, when the government was completely failing to do anything except start to begin to terrify people and probably the wrong people, 
um, we just had to get on with it and do it ourselves, you know, and that's what was, that's what David Francis book, how to survive a plague um, in the States. That's what, that's what that's all about. But we did it ourselves here too. You know, that's how the Terence Higgins trust got set up. Um, this is a, this is a, a, a pack <laughs> it was published by the GLC myself and Peter Tatchell and one or two others produced it. Um, and we just had to get on with educating ourselves. Chris, um, forgive me. Did, did, did you write that piece for us in the in the middle of the summer? That's not you, is it? I wrote a, 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 a letter. A letter down to me. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you write it, that? Yeah, it was a letter to my late partner. Yeah. It was. I was so unbelievably moving. I absolutely wept. And and um, I'm sorry. I should have. I should have clocked and and, and clocked the name. <laughs> Uh, the truth is, I don't know whether it's Tuesday or Sunday and in the middle of the week, so, so you'll understand. But it was so incredibly moving. And I just, and listening to you now, I sort of wonder, this is a complete tangent, but whether or not you feel, sorry, this is a complete supposition, so, so discounted if it's the, the wrong direction, that you're sort of thinking, hang on a second, why is all of those things take, why did it all take so long on AIDS when you can see how when the world sets its mind to something, how fast medical science can move. Are you, are you, does that, are you feeling like that? Is that a fair? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I felt like that a lot. And, and, I, and I, think, I think many of those of us who are survivors of that time, have felt that and we felt, um, it's just impossible to avoid it really. We felt angry, we felt hurt. I, you know, I, feel, I feel quite upset even talking about it. It's easier to write about it actually. Um, but some, but but yeah, um, absolutely. Well, I, I thank you. I mean, thank you. I, there is something I, you can hear my voice. I'm hesitant because I'm not sure what it is. But there is something to be said. We we had this. Sorry, and this is the kind of journalistic urge, which is okay. Well, what is there there that you could really explore that gets you to to, to something that like that. that that's not just reflective, but but looks forward to. We had a really interest, incredibly interesting conversation over a year ago now in our newsroom, Chris, before we got, uh, you know, into the sort of digital news meetings. And it was about bias around contraception. And it was actually about the kind of institutional um, uh, prejudices of the healthcare industry, not in not not in pay or representation, but in investment and uh, the kinds of tests they're done, which is sort of echoes, I guess, the same point. And I wonder whether there is something really worth looking into in this, which is what we've learned about the the way in which the healthcare industry attacks issues of, of urgency and how it chooses them. I don't know what you. I don't know where you where you point us. Um, well, I, 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 th I think, you know, a really interesting place to look is, is, is some of the guys in the States who were at the forefront of, of, of ACT UP, um, um, who Greg, uh, Greg Gonsalves, uh, Peter Staley and others, the, the characters in How to Survive a Plague, um, who, you know, obviously it changed their lives, it changed all of their lives. Um, Greg's now an epidemiologist. Um, Peter Staley has been at the heart of the um, uh, the community campaign that's gone on in New York, um, and and I, I you know I, th I think I, I think now is the time. I've been doing a lot of a lot of retrospective reflecting, but now is the time to you know particularly with the arrival of the vaccine to really get to grips with um, yeah. this can tell us about the future. I think what you know one other thing I'd say. Is that um, is, is 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 and this is a bit unformed. I'm still thinking about it. Um, I have been thinking about it a lot. Is the whole issue of risk and people's willingness to take risk? Um, uh, you know, people continued. Um, people in the gay community continued to take risks, um, even when we had knowledge, even when there were drugs available, even now that preps available. You know, um, science public health doesn't eliminate risk, doesn't eliminate no. people's propensity to behave perhaps less than, less than rationally. Um, uh, so I, I think that whole area of, 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 of risk and behaviour is, 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 is one that we could really usefully yeah. reflect on. Um, the, big the big difference, of course, sorry, I, the big difference, of course, is that, uh, is that 
is that with COVID, you know, it's something you can't see. It's something that's, that's um, uh, you know, we just go out on the street and, 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 and so on. Whereas actually we did get to a point, you know, within, I mean, not soon enough, but within a few years, remarkable saying within a few years rather than weeks or months, but um, we did get to a point where we knew that if we abstained from certain sexual activity, um, that, that, that we could eliminate the risk. Um, didn't mean we did, of course. No, no, but that's but the, all of all of that, Chris. Firstly, I should just say anyone who hasn't read Chris's letter from lockdown really do. It will have you in pieces, but it will also um, make you make you think a good deal about many things. But actually, I think the interesting thing there, Chris, is that intersection we're talking about now, which is between behaviour. It's the point that Nimmo was making too. It's sort of, you know, there's one thing being told what's available as another thing whether you whether you take it um i'm gonna i'm gonna go on if i might chris just to phoebe and nikki the reason i'm interested phoebe in your point about whether or not people apply these same arguments about uh you know uh adverse impacts of taking vaccines when they take them when they go on holiday to places is my impression is if you you know i vaccinated my whole family last year because we had to go to a place where you had to have a yellow fever jab and I was like, okay, well, that's what we've got to do. And because you had to do it, I didn't really think twice about it. There's no expectation, I think, with this vaccine of imposing mandatory um, vaccination, but I wonder whether you can incentivize it differently. And so I, I wonder what you thought on that. Yeah, so I think that's a good point though about the fact that you didn't think about it because I had the same thing, I went traveling, I went to my GP, I said I'm going to these locations, these are the vaccinations I'm going to need, yellow fever I didn't need but it came up and she was like well you can get it if you want, like you can just get it now and then you're sorted and it was the most casual conversation and I got you know 15 jabs over six weeks because I was traveling to multiple places. Um, to the point where you know they were running out of a hepatitis jab and they said oh just have this one instead so i had no idea what brand i was being injected with i had no idea where it was coming from if it was pfizer if it was anyone and i was happy to do that because i knew it was necessary for me to travel to those countries and you know it's the same conversation with anti-malarials if anyone's heard any of the horror stories around anti-malarials and people taking those they can have really severe impacts on on and cause hallucinations yeah, and I'm sure other people have heard those as well, and I heard those when I was traveling. So my question is, I guess, was, you know, if people were, if people are so happy to take those when they're going on holiday to Brazil, as I think it was mentioned in the chat um, by Nikki, then, you know, why couldn't we do the same here? And, and it may not be a mandatory across the board, but I know there was rumors that people were putting out there for festivals like Glastonbury or, you know, those big meetings or for a concert that it would be mandatory that you come to that with a with a vaccine. So like you said, like incentivization is, do you need to have that kind of personal aspect of it for people to feel safe? Or is it just around public messaging and we're so used to travel vaccinations now that it doesn't matter? I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested, if Colin Prendergast is still here, I'm going to come to him in one moment, because you were saying he's a doctor, and I imagine you're beginning to see some of these conversations happening with, with, with patients, but, 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 but Nikki Gorb, if you were there, Nikki, I was just going to ask you what you make of this. Yes, sorry, I was on my phone. Hi, James. Um, Hi I, I agree with Phoebe, and, um, I took mine 30 years ago and I didn't think twice about it, you know, the, the yellow fever. And I've lived in Nicaragua where people have typhoid all the time and you just get used to doing it. It's sort of yeah. like, it becomes part of the common sense, you know, the sociological sense of this is just what you do. And it feels like there's no question about it. I really like Phoebe's comment about incentivize. So I knew I was wanted to go to the Pantanal, to the jungle. Mm -hmm. Um, I have my, I've still got my little certificate with it stamped in there, yellow fever, and I had to pay for my vaccination as well through the GP. It wasn't for free. I think I even had to go to the Tropical Medicine Centre in London. Yeah. So there was quite a lot of hoops to go through, but I, and I didn't even know what yellow fever was, to be honest. So that's right. another thing, like, so they, a bit like fever, I didn't know what vaccinations I was getting, what was in it. And I love the idea about festivals. So you, you, you get your wristband, and then you also have your wristband say I'm COVID vaccination free. It's interesting. So the positive, we know from behavior change medicine, it's the motivation factors are positive ones. Yes. 
I think the thing that's interesting to me, I saw that as you were speaking, Nikki, that my colleague Basher is saying, look, actually, most people, vast, vast majority of people don't go to Brazil and have a, or the Pantanal, or go, you know, go and have a, go and have a, a vaccination. So they're not sort of making these choices. What's interesting is that when you want to do something, it's not a point really about travel, it's when you want to do something, like, yeah, fine, okay, if that's what it is, that's what it is. And so I wonder whether or not there's a way of incentivizing certain uh, uh, certain behaviors. Um, I, I can't come to, I can't come to, Colin Prendergast, I can't seem to find him, unless you're there. Colin, are you there? No, I can't seem to find you, but I but I did notice that Louise Jarvis was just making the same point, and I was gonna come back uh, to Louise if I could. Louise, are you around? I noticed that you uh, uh, rather warmly described yourself as saying, I'm up to a pin cushion when I'm traveling, which I rather liked. Um, I don't know whether I can- uh, yeah. Oh yeah, we've already spoken about the vitamin D. No, no, no. So I know, I just ask, I would just ask you, no, no, I would just ask, that's the reason why I said I wanted to come back to you. Yeah, yeah. So, whether or not you think, because the reason why vitamin D was the, um, is easy is because it's very low, um, it's if you like very, very low barrier to entry. Very few people can go. Oh no, I'm not going to take vitamin D. You're saying you, when you go travelling, you're happy to get um, uh, uh, vaccinated. Do you yeah. think there are things that you would do in the UK that if they said, look, if you've got the vaccine, you can come and do this. You know, if you've got the vaccine, you can use the local gym, or you can come and do X or Y. I, I, you, I mean. You, Personally, I, I'm not sure whether I've got a major issue with vaccine or not. I didn't have an issue, but now having this discussion, I'm like, oh, should I be having an issue? <laughs> um, so I'm going to flip the other way. But, but I, I just think it would be very difficult to bring in, particularly at this time with the trust and everything with the government, to bring in, you can't do X without Y yeah. and see that as a positive enforcement. People will just say, I just want to go to the gym and why shouldn't I? We've been going to the gym for years. So I think because travel in a way that's been years and years and it's it's it is now just in built particularly if you're going to some reason some areas and whatever yes that that's what you have to do and i want to go and travel to africa or whatever whatever so i need to do x y and z i didn't even think of it but i think to bring it in i think just would be very difficult and people that will know are oh, you're just being manipulative you're being whatever There's things like the festivals i can see yeah, I th yeah, it'd be very difficult to pick and choose. It's, 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 yeah, it's a difficult I, one. I think it's, it's interesting because I think it is going to happen mm. piecemeal. I think that the airlines, for example, are going to say, yeah. if you, we, we need to have a proof of vaccination. I'm sure that will happen. And very quickly, Definitely. it will become, there'll be a pattern of it. Um, I'm going to, uh, I want to uh, come as we just get to the last uh, uh, five minutes. Um, Firstly, I didn't know whether Richard Caldwell, I, I like your point about going to the pub. I didn't know whether you wanted to weigh in, Richard, because I know you've made a number of uh, observations just about the vaccine itself. Um, if not, are you there? I'm here. Oh, hello, Richard. Hi. Yeah, yeah, it was just the, uh, the one vaccine not being the same as another, that yes. um, inhibiting uh, infection is not the same as inhibiting transmission. And there's a very, I think, good case of wanting people to not transmit and be socially responsible about that. So uh, we're talking about the vaccine. There's going to be multiple vaccines that will do different things, and we need to understand that. Yeah, I think so. I, I, this, is, this, is a, this is an area of things, I have to confess, that I feel like we haven't really looked into at all, which is what happens when there's a marketplace for multiple vaccines, and you, the, you are not the purchaser, you are the recipient as a citizen. That seems to me to be a really complicated uh, issue because it's not the same as it's not the same as multiple treatments for different illnesses. It's a it's a vaccine. So I think we should definitely come back to it. I, I'm I, th thank you. I'm I'm going to come if I might just to close back to you, Kerry, because I do I tell you where, where I, I I am interested in your point about we wouldn't be having this conversation if it weren't for the anti-vax movement. And there is a, uh, there's been, if you like, a recurrent theme of 2020, which has been East versus West, right? Controlled societies versus free societies. And the arguments that you even hear made by our own ministers, made by the likes of Boris Johnson and Matthew Hancock, is that it's been harder to limit infection because we are a society that, 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 that 
that cherishes even takes for granted our freedoms. There's a risk I would have thought, Kerry, that what we go into now is a world in which freedom of speech bangs up against, um, uh, you know, collective action on the vaccine. And I just wondered whether or not, if you were thinking about this thing, not just from a public comms point of view, but from an out regulation of platforms point of view, how you would approach the anti-vax issue. I mean, this is going to be a scrap, isn't it? I think the, you know, there's, there's a long um, tradition when I was at the BBC for all those years, that the, the, it was clear then that the, 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 there was a science lobby that wanted us at the BBC to stop covering stories that they thought were scientific. There was a, <clears throat> there was a BBC review that, took, that, was, that was chaired by a number of leading scientists, I think including Robert Winston, who, who came up with a solution which was that all coverage for the BBC should, before it was put to air, should be approved by a panel of scientists. Um, which just seemed like like a piece of madness and exceptionalism that only a bunch of scientists could yeah. could come up with. So thankfully that never happened. I think the um, oh you know I'm I'm all over the map on this. My, my my traditional view of the media has been that we should give people the facts to make up their own minds, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that that feels. That feels sort of, right, Richard. I only meant that as a kind of um, people who, <laughs> who, 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 who who think there is who think that politics doesn't matter. Yeah. That's, that, that's what I meant by it. Um, I I've never been sure that closing down um, closing down channels where bad news circulates is enough. In itself to um, to stop bad news circulating. I, you can certainly, you know, we, we're doing a piece about QAnon at the moment, and and it's clear from that that all the efforts by the mainstream platforms to um, to, to marginalise it will get you so far, but not not the mm -hmm. whole way. Mm. And, I, and I, you know, you, you've taken us into this huge huge debate about um, whether you regulate the social media platforms. If you do. Who regulates? I've never personally been particularly in favour of the social media platforms themselves being the arbiters of speech on their platforms. I think that's for us. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a role for society and for and for governments. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm afraid, James, you've got no kind of answer out of me at all. No, no, no. Except for the fact that it's going to be a scrap. I mean, the fact is, it is going to be a scrap, and this is going to be, you know, we, we're 20 years into the question of truth exact, exaggeration manipulation and polarization online and so far the answer of free society so has been a shrug you know and i and i suppose what's changed for me is that it used to be the case that you know if that the politics felt definitively on the side of truth that we had a convention that that politicians yes. would not would not knowingly stand up, particularly in the House of Commons, and tell lies. And that seemed to me that changed in 2016. Yeah. And I, th I thought that was one of the reasons why, for example, I thought the BBC struggled in the early days of the, of the EU referendum campaign, because we were confronted with mainstream politicians who were suddenly breaking that convention that had been kind of part of the furniture for as long as we could remember. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, one of the things I have to get my head around is, um, if politics or some politicians have shifted on that spectrum, that's a big change. And how do we account for that in the mix of everything else? Okay. Well, that uh, that will look to us nicely because we're going to we are uh, Kerry and I are, are wrestling this particular subject because we're going to discuss it tomorrow as we as we record the behind the news podcast. We've been thinking about this a fair bit, so we'll come into that and we'll come into vaccines. Just to say, uh, we 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 are looking at the sort of the behind the scenes uh, decisions around this lockdown, I think we are going to look at the way in which the government is approaching uh, vaccines. If you heard the podcast from a couple of weeks ago, we looked at that and that, that's a commission in progress, hence the, hence the interest in what's happened with Kate Bingham, etc. Um, but this is really interesting, uh, the point about variety of vaccines in the marketplace, the point about incentives, the point about uh, vitamin D, the point about distribution and who decides, these are going to be subjects we come back to. Can I just say a huge, uh, a huge thank you to everyone uh, for joining us. Um, 
this is one of those subjects where there are, the more threads you pull out, the more threads you discover. So thank you for everyone's time and genuinely uh, for helping us uh, come away from this, a big news item, uh, possibly not with all the answers, but with a lot better questions. I uh, hope you have a very good afternoon and uh, thanks for joining us.